care about. So with that, um, we now have, um, I want to thank uh, Ms. Donna Chisdale here. I became aware of Donna. I was aware of Donna. I hadn't met her. And I saw the read up, reader article, which follows on the excellent work that East County Magazine did on the subject of wind and large scale solar, uh, which is a form of industrialization. And that all of these green folks out here suddenly begin experiencing things that none of us anticipated, or at least some of us didn't anticipate. So with that, I'll turn it over to Donna, and uh, she very kindly put together a presentation for us, which we appreciate. Well, I like to do show and tell. And I got my um, start, my call to action was when a 600-acre landfill was proposed next door to our ranch and all of our neighbors on tribal land that was very uh, baptism by fire. But after a 25-year battle, the tribe voted it down. Um, so me, I'm a volunteer activist. I don't get paid for anything I do. I'm from an extended farming family, Valley, Pure Valley. Lived in Boulevard for 35 years. I'm an elected volunteer chair of the Boulevard Planning Group. Um, Co-founder, President Backcountry Against Dumps for the landfill, and secretary for the Protect Our Communities Foundation. So these are the main issues with industrial scale wind and solar, and the, they all take a lot of infrastructure. Uh, rural sacrifice zones, uh, most decisions are made by urban legislators. Um, disproportionate impacts, environmental justice issues because most of these communities are very poor. Um, expensive and disruptive new infrastructure. They're talking about two more Sunrise Power Links coming through our area. Increased risk of wildfire. This is a huge issue. High use of limited groundwater. We have no access to imported water if anything comes out of the ground. Um, a lot of adverse health effects that we've become aware of, including noise from turbines, electrical and visual pollution, and just a change of the ecology, uh, ecology and quality of life. Uh, a lot of these projects get total waivers, sequel waivers, and overriding considerations. Um, amendments to long fought community plans and general plans, and just unjustified bias. So I won't go through all these, but this is a list of some of the projects I'm working on now. These are massive projects. We've got, I think, four or five lawsuits. We've got four hearings, court hearings in November. Um, these are multinational companies, um, a lot of them foreign country companies, ST, um, SEMPRA, stg and &E. I also work with a lot of experts because as a community activist, we have to be honest, we have to be, um, have factual information, unlike our opponents quite often. <laughs> So this uh, doesn't show up very well. Um, well, maybe it does. This is the map. All those colors are massive projects. You see Boulevard there in the middle, tiny. Um, Boulevard's not even uh, mentioned. Our town isn't even shown on the map. Octillo is full of turbines now. And you can't really see it, but there's a little line of yellow dots, and that's uh, Thule Wind. So this beautiful area right here, it's the big rock in the middle is sacred to the Kumeyaay. But BLM downgraded this area to industrial to accommodate Ibadrola, and then they amended a record of decision within about 30 days to give Sunrise a power easement, a power line easement. So these things are about 480 to 515 feet tall. Uh, the people on the right are the county staff I brought out to show them what was going on. You can see a tribal home on the left there, about a quarter mile from the turbines. They have trouble sleeping. And then a private home about two miles from the, the existing turbines. They have trouble sleeping. The um, the mother of the household has migraines from the turbines. So this t uh, tribal home on the left is abandoned because the turbines make too much noise. It vibrates. Um, and on the right is a, a family. The grandmother has kidney uh, cancer, and the granddaughter has unexplained deep stomach pain and skin rashes. And when they go away, uh, the skin rashes and the stomach pain eases. Um, pattern energy, $600 million octio wind. The residents and tribal uh, representatives protested this. Um, uh, we actually consider it basically a fraud. Um, the wind resources aren't there, and the $600 million project quite often stands idle. Um, all of these projects take huge amount of infrastructure. On the left is the new Boulevard substation. Uh, they tore down an affordable home, a large oak tree, um, and there's homes right adjacent to this. And on the right is the Suncrest substation in Alpine, where they blew off the top of the mountain to put this huge um, <coughs> substation, the neighbors complain of noise. So McCain Valley Road access on the left is before the Sunrise Power Link, and on the right is the Sunrise Power Link. Um, we were just run over. Um, this, is, this picture does not do it justice. This is STG&E's new 85-acre, $435 million eco-substation. Um, 
they are tearing up cultural resources. This was supposed to be a designated area, um, but they're bulldozing them. Um, about 50 to 100 million gallons of water right now. It's coming out of the Indian Reservation next to my ranch and next to tribal homes um, without being properly authorized, or it's being trucked in from the cities. So they've got these 10,000 gallon water trucks running up and down the highways in our rural roads uh, to haul water to this remote site. So I put that one in twice, sorry about that. Uh, this is one of our big concerns. Um, the eco substation at full capacity will have 500,000 gallons of flammable transformer oil. We have volunteer fire departments. Right now they have been dark in Boulevard and Cumba, meaning they're not staffed. Um, took two days for this to be put out in Escondido. Um, this is a fire at uh, my ranch last year, Shockey Fire, uh, blew through, uh, took out 11 homes, killed one of my neighbors. It was started by gunfire. But when I asked the firefighters there who came in from as far as Santa Barbara, would you have been able to fight this fire here if we'd had turbines on this ridge next to us and all these solar projects? They said, no, we would not be able to fight that fire. You would be uh, basically um, anybody within 1,000 feet. Um, they have to de-energize projects. You cannot de-energize a solar project. And uh, turbines create a lot of turbulence. So this is the Soytech Solar. This is one module here at UCSD. You can see the glare from it. Uh, they claim there's not going to be a glare. Almost 7,300 of these are planted Boulevard on almost 2.3 square miles. Uh, that will equal about the square footage of 47 Super Walmart centers. Um, this is a, on the left is the footprint. It's about a five mile wide footprint. On the right is the location where this is going to go. Uh, it's a beautiful area. Um, We've got a lot of golden eagles. This is also full of uh, cultural resources. It's the Tule Creek floodplain. Um, on the left is a giant oak tree that sits in the middle of this project on state land. Um, and, the, and one of our few uh, rare water sources is spring fed. You can see an egret there in the picture if you look closely. So on the left here is another uh, Soytech solar site proposed uh, within 200 feet of the house on the right that has its own solar project, solar panels. Um, we just got word that this project was withdrawn. No explanation, no public announcement yet, but we're very happy. Um, this one is another, the view of the, the 22 megawatt Soytech Solar. Um, and on the right is the, the, a similar view where we've had golden eagles and bighorn sheep. On the left is the Terra del Sol um, project. Well, both these pictures, 420 acres, 60 megawatts. The largest one I think that Soytech has is maybe um, two to three megawatts, and I think they have less than 20 megawatts worldwide, but they're putting 80 megawatt project in Boulevard and a 60 megawatt and a 22. This is right at the border. On the left is Jardina del Rincon with the modest homes there. And you have to remember that Chaparral sequesters carbon above and below ground. This will all be gone. This is the footprint. You can see how many uh, modules will be there, over 2,000 of them, with a lot of inverters within 100 feet of homes. The homes are on all four sides of this project. On the southern side, they're in Mexico, in Hilo Hakame. So also, Imperial Valley farmland. On the left is what it looks like. I know some people have problems with farm, but if you like to eat, you should like farming. Um, it's being temporarily converted for 40 years. On the right is what it looks like. Um, and this Imperial County has the highest asthma rates um, almost in the nation. On the left is one of the converted farms. It doesn't show up too good in this, but you can see when you're standing there, there's heat waves coming off of these panels. So I'm concerned that it's going to be heat island effects will actually affect weather patterns. On the right is the glare from the solar project from, from the elevated areas. Um, it's pretty significant. This is some of the infrastructure for these passive solar. They are very invasive. Uh, I stand next to this solar project. I was about 200 yards away at one point. And I could hear the inverters humming. It sounded like a freeway. Um, and these are being put into quiet areas. So on the left is the, the danger signs at the Borrego uh, microgrid substation. On the right is um, fluorescent lights lit up with the power of the electrical field from the power line. So here again, we've got green oxygen production plants and crops are being turned into dusty, dusty electrical hazard areas. And farmland is supposed to be protected statewide and federally. It's not. Um, this is one of the former irrigation districts. At, this is a solar farm. You can see the amount of soil that has eroded in just a matter of months. And unfortunately, soil in Imperial County and eastern San Diego County is endemic for valley fever. So when you disturb the soil or you quit irrigating it, then, then all of this is, is subject to be exposed. 
So these are some of the issues we've got. Um, some of the legislation that supports industry uh, and absentee developers over community needs. AB 900 fast tracks a ju judicial review. A judge found that to be unconstitutional, um, but Governor Brown certified two of the Soytech projects in the Boulevard. We never got a notice. Found out it had been posted on one website for a couple weeks, but no public notice published. Um, SB 33, um, that would remove public right to vote on the creation of uh, and bonding of renewable energy infrastructure zones, and one is planned to cover almost entirely entire area of boulevard planning area in East County. And then SB 743, that was a gut and amend, and it supports the judici judicial streamlining for those AB 900 certified projects, which includes two in Boulevard. So this was Governor Brown's comment at the groundbreaking of the Suncrest substation, um, and how he referred to those of us who were trying to defend our families our property values, our quality of life, and lifetime investments, and tribal representatives who were um, trying to defend their cultural resources. So, like everybody else is talking about here, there's a lot better ways to do this um, that don't require all this invasive uh, destruction and would actually help people reduce their bills instead of increasing them continually. So, um, thank you very much. I tried to rush through. Imperial Irrigation District, IID. Yeah, to, to take their land out of production. And the farmers were actually getting paid to do that. Do you happen to know if these projects were on that type of land? Um, most of that was, um, it had to be taken out of the fallowing in order to do these projects, I think. I couldn't swear to that. My family farms, my father was on the Imperial Irrigation District and a president one time before he passed away from cancer. Um, and, and the water issue is a huge controversy, and one of our concerns in, in the Pirro Valley also is that this is a way to take away water from farmland and actually um, give it back to the cities. So it's a huge rural-urban battle. It depends on who you talk to on what's actually happening. Right. I, I'm They're claiming that this water will come back to these, this farmland after 40 years, and we're saying there's no way in, you know what, that that's going to happen because cities are, will be saying uh, that farmland is dormant, that water needs to go somewhere else, and it will never come back. The question I, I, you're, I understand what you're telling us. The question I have is, do you happen to know if the owners of the land are getting the subsidy from the water district as well as having I don't think the owners are. The, the private farmland, and I believe that Imperial Irrigation District, um, again, this is very controversial and I haven't been, had time to stay involved in it, but I believe that the Imperial Irrigation District was trying to figure out a way to count that converted farmland as part of the following, but I don't know if that happened or not. I'm sure that was the intent. <laughs> it's very, very controversial. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, Supervisor Diane Jacob at this point is our only ally, even um, Supervisor Ron. Uh, we were hoping that Supervisor Dave Roberts might be more community-minded, but he has told us, and Soytech is in his district, their manufacturing facility. And at the Renewable Energy Plan um, hearing Tuesday, Wednesday, time flies, maybe it was, maybe it was yesterday, <laughs> um, both uh, Supervisors Ron Roberts and Dave Roberts made it very clear that they want these large-scale projects to go through in, in, in um, the rural areas. But I don't think that they've made the connection that the more large-scale projects are built on farmland in Pura Valley and on rural lands in East County, the fewer projects will be built here in the urban basin where the energy is consumed. And, and like I said, at least two more 500 kV lines, I've seen reports, or at least two more are planned. Uh, but they haven't really announced that yet. Those are always buried in the, the more obscure uh, projects. So those are huge, 
huge. Uh, and two of the SoyTech projects, we had the, the 1.9 billion Sunrise PowerLink, the $435 million Eco Substation, Boulevard Substation, which includes another 14 miles of transmission line. Each one of these projects requires their own substation, a whole new generation tie line, which is 138 kV. Um, it, it is a massive thing, and San Diego uh, supervisors actually voted to allow Thule Wind to allow their power lines to be overhead. So while the urban area is burying their power lines, we are being inundated with power lines in the most fire-prone area of the county and, and being told it's cheaper for the developer. So, you know, we're, we're just kind of cast aside with collateral damage, unfortunately, in this in this revolution, and, and there's, it's unnecessary because if everyone here has talked about tonight, all this can be done at the, where the energy is consumed, and that's where it should be done. And it can be done in a variety of ways. And that's what we need to con convince our leaders, including the Board of Supervisors, but they're being lobbied heavily. I was attacked at the board hearing the other day. They told uh, one of the developers, absentee developers, who was uh, hosting one of these large projects, got up and talked about our Boulevard Community Planning Group that there were bottles passed around in brown bags at our meeting and that we, people were told to go out and have a fist fight in the, in, the, in the parking lot and that guns were mentioned. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? So it's, if they can get up and make these bald statements that are blatant falsehoods and, and we have to try to defend ourselves against you know, well-funded lobbyists and SD Jean and Sempra and all of these. So I've been told that many of these people are looking for a way to sue me. And I've told several of them, go ahead, when we get you in court, then we have the right of discovery, and you will be deposed. SD Jean E, I was deposed for eight hours um, on the Sunrise Power Link on our lawsuit. And it wasn't SD Jean E attorneys. I mean, it wasn't the Bureau of Land Management attorneys who we were suing. It was SD Jean E attorneys interrogating me for eight hours. So we lost that at the Ninth Circuit on a technicality, um, and President Peavy sent a letter to the Ninth Circuit Court saying Sunrise Power Link was necessary. So a lot is going on behind the scenes, and uh, we, need, we need organizing, we need outreach, we need to join forces, and the next time the Board of Supervisors has a, has a meeting or a hearing, we need to be there in force. And what they did the other day was both of the, the developers and, and the industry got together and Diane Jacob could not get the vote for renewable energy plan if she left in the economic study for comparing the cost of different types of generation and the cost of transmission. That was removed. So. I'm Paul Cruz with the East Atlantic Magazine, and uh, please don't view that as uh, my comment or you know, my, my questioning um, as uh, you know, fighting you or disagreeing with you. But uh, you made some. What is your background? Are you a, a what is your, are your I'm self-educated. I didn't even go to college. And my second question is that you, you, you made you know, claims regarding um, all of the um, alleged um, health effects uh, that um, have been you've alleged because of the uh, windmills or uh, the, uh, the wind industrial turbines. wind turbines. Yes, and uh, but uh, you're talking about. The Imperial Valley, but at the same time, you know that the Imperial Valley is known as the breadbasket of the United States, and they do use a lot of chemicals and fertilizers. So, which one do you think it? Uh, do you think it maybe the there can be organic farming. There is organic farming, um, in my opinion. What I've seen, uh, industrial solar, um, is more devastating to the environment than farming. But that's my opinion. And on the, the health impacts, I, I don't just uh, say things. I do a lot of research, and we managed to raise some money and do some um, acoustical testing with experts, and they did find uh, document infrasound at every home that they went to and even several miles away um, at it's supposed to have been a control site. And that is part of our some of our lawsuits and is being finalized for um, addition to the lawsuits. So um, we also brought in some, tried to hire people to do um, power quality because at the homes, especially the tribal homes near the wind turbines, there's a significant amount of uh, electrical magnetic interference and the ground currents at one of the, several of the homes, if the turbines are going, I cannot even stand on the ground. I have to sit up on my car, which is on rubber tires, and get my feet off the ground. I don't know how they live there. I really don't. And it's, uh, it's, it's burning a hole in my heart that I cannot help them, cannot find attorneys to represent them 
against these companies, including sdg &E. We could not find a local power person to help us because they did not want to go against sdg &E. Who was the company who did the um, studies with the uh, sound? Um, I always forget the name. It's like Wilson and Erig. It's a big, big company our, our attorney recommended. But for the power quality, we had to bring in some guy from New Jersey <laughs> to get it done. And of course, because he's not a big guy and, and doesn't have all the right initials, it's you know, easily dismissed. Yes? Yeah, is there any governmental agency at any level um, that's uh, looking into the potential health effects relating to Just the opposite. Just, yeah. just mean, the opposite. Even in other states, because it would be interesting to compare what's going on. It is it's just the opposite. I, I went to Denver uh, last month or earlier this month, I lost track of time, and spent five days at the um, International Noise Consultants, Consultant Engineers, whatever they're, they're. And someone I knew from Canada who deals with communities and is a retired pharmacist and is very careful with her information gave a presentation and she was viciously attacked by even health representatives. Health Canada, people from Australia, and the engineers that are making a ton of money right now trying to prove that, that wind turbines don't make noise. And I know a lot of people want to think turbines are good, and they may be if you don't live by them. But I know people that have abandoned their homes. I know people who want to abandon their homes. I work with people, um, doctors and noise experts and sound and, and psychiatrists and everybody. Um, it's real, and, and it's, it's a shame that it's being dismissed. And our, our government, is, is actually uh, working against us because this is their agenda to move the turbines and these large-scale projects forward at any cost. So uh, it's not right to, to swap one kind of pollution for another. Uh, I thought that the Reader article was, was pretty good from Lehman's perspective on this topic in terms of getting down into, into, some, of, into some of these issues. and. Um, Incredible way, it, and I. Uh, not that this is incredible, but I, mean, I thought it was. I thought it was a step forward in terms of bringing this issue to people's awareness. We're talking about north of South San Diego, but as I've been educated by my good and um, friend Miriam, you know that this there's there's something called East San Diego, <laughs> and we don't talk about it enough. I'm wondering about the medical facilities out there because you're talking about some, are they seeing uh, a trend go through the community? Because they must be point of documentation uh, in terms of what you're describing. We had hoped so. We had hoped so and we had even, I had even tried to get a health impact assessment uh, going and through the environmental justice um, community in Imperial County. I was connected with uh, San Marcos um, Latino uh, National, National Latino Research Center and um, their director and they actually, um, I got them together with the tribal leadership at Manzanita and there was, um, it was going forward and their uh, initial study which was limited to the number of people showed that 68 percent of the tribal members were, were reporting an increased problem with respiratory, uh, which can be uh, linked to an exposure to electrical pollution. Brought in Dr. M uh, Sam Milham, who is a retired um, public health. I'm sorry, I I've got Lyme disease and sometimes when I get really tired my brain kind of <laughs> uh, deserts me. But anyway, um, and he came out and did some, some uh, tests. He's, his, his forte, he wrote a book called Dirty Electricity, and, and he, of course, he's the target of a lot of industry people and, and people that don't want to believe that there can be a problem. Um, he came out and did tests and um, put in some filters for some of them. But when it turned out that what he was doing may interfere with a proposed wind project on the reservation, um, it got uh, cut off. And at one point, I was told to leave the reservation, even though I had permission from tribal homeowners to do the acoustic test. That, that they did not have individual rights and they had no right to allow me to come to their homes to help them. That later, of course, was proven to be false, which we knew at the time, but when tribal leaders are telling you they're going to call the tribal police, uh, you need to take your equipment and go. Just a quick follow-up. This reminds me very much, I, I was living in the Castro at Ground Zero at the onset of AIDS before it had a name, and this reminds me very much of the dismissal 
uh, that went on for decades and millions of people died because of the refusal to discuss this. But um, is the Center for Disease Control a resource for you? Uh, they are deter They have uh, dismissed um, uh, Dr. Nina Pierpont um, did a, um, a study and, and it was peer reviewed and, um, and, and termed it Wintergren syndrome and listed the, the impacts that people suffer and it has been dismissed by the Center of Disease Control as a, as a syndrome. So it's, it's, it's a matter of exposure and your sensitivity. Some people can be exposed and not notice anything and other people are totally devastated. Any other questions or comments? Carl? Yeah, without, without challenging anything that you said there, I mean, you know, the, the world is trying to find a way to be, uh, to be fossil free. And it's going to take a lot of land, whether you want to do biofuels from algae or wind or solar or those kinds of things. And how do you, how would you suggest approaching, you know, the massive use of land to create energy in ways that, that meet the needs of the future and the needs of the world, you know, recognizing the kinds of challenges why can't it be done on the new and existing uh, structures? Why can't it be done that way? We've got, uh, I've got friends that own an organic jojoba farm in Desert Center. Been there for 30 years. Jojoba is one of the purest forms of biodiesel. Uh, it's, it's very, it's uh, acclimated to the desert, uses very little water, and yet they're being surrounded on four sides by a 4,000 acre solar farm. The first year it was being constructed, they lost 40% production because of dust on their crop. So um, we have to, do, do we give up food crops to generate energy when that energy can be generated elsewhere? Do we give up uh, intact ecosystems uh, where we have some of the few um, remaining places where people, within an hour's drive, people can go from the city and be out in, in a wilderness area yeah, without driving through you, all this? So your suggestion is that it'll be done on rooftops of I'm, I'm suggesting it can be done and it should be done. I think everybody, uh, we asked stg &E, why don't you give everybody in the back, you say you're building this for reliability, why don't you give everybody, you know, their own little solar panels and backup uh, batteries, why don't you do that? That would be more reliable than having power lines through the backcountry. Yes? If I could tag on to that, I live in North County. City of Vista alone has 14 million square feet of industrial space. A lot of that is warehouse space, just used for an office and, and warehousing material, a lot of rooftop. Right now, with the current policies, for most people, it doesn't make sense to do, to, for most people, it just makes sense to minimize through net energy metering to cover the on-site use of that electricity. So you have literally millions of square feet of rooftop just in Vista. Look at the rest of the county and what we could do with an effective policy that encourages people to maximize that roof space, like a feasible feed-in tariff. It's, I mean, it's not only Germany, it's 80 countries around the world. It's, but most countries don't have three industrial utilities that control 90% of the state's electrical production. We've got rooftops, we've got parking lots, we can do this thing if we get the policy right. Well, the other thing, my our concern is those of us that, that live through the massive uh, firestorms. When you put extra infrastructure and new ignition sources out in the backcountry, um, and uh, today I drove in on Interstate 8, and there was two fires along Interstate 8. It looked like they'd been started probably by either an arsonist or somebody with a bad catalytic converter. Uh, out in the backcountry, when you've got all this infrastructure, it's very difficult to get there. To, to fight a fire, and those fires burn into the, into the city areas. So, just one fire sparked by one of these projects is, is incredibly costly. Yeah, like, like I said, I wasn't arguing your points at all. I, I, I'm just, you know, every every argument to not do something in my mind always needs to say what's well, the Well, that's why I, I put all this here. Um, Bill Powers was involved in a study, I, I think it was 7,000, at least approximately 7,000 megawatts of capacity in the built environment. Department of Defense has their new energy efficiency, renewable energy innovate. The, the community choice aggregation, combined heat and power, um, commercial, residential, geothermal heat pumps, ground pumps, fuel cells, uh, the run of the sun, environmental health coalition, green jobs. Um, I do have a problem with uh, solar inverters and smart meters. I think they need to be cleaned up so that they don't uh, put out um, harmonics and, and other problems, but um, it's, it's 
you need to do it right the first time rather than making all the mistakes. You cannot, I'm sorry, but those solar projects, this, that farmland will not come back. And it can never be replaced. It's non-renewable. Make one comment here because this comes up all the time about why can't we all get along and we've got to do the green energy thing. And because we're not putting any solar in the city right now with our utilities program, we are battling over 300 megawatt gas turbine will go in in Otai because we don't have enough local generation here. And it's strictly a utility money game. Of course we would put it here <coughs> if we cared about the collective amount of money that we're spending on this. But we've got a lot of good-hearted people here who want to do the right thing, but they are not the people who have the power to make the call. And hopefully we'll get there at some point. But we are putting Kiyosera solar panels and other fine panels in Imperial County to justify putting in billions of dollars of transmission, and because we're not putting it here, we have to build all the backup power in San Diego. So we're spending a tremendous amount, wasting a tremendous amount of money. And so the, to listen to this collateral damage just aggravates me, because this is, not only are we wasting huge resources when, when we would like to get the job done, but the people living in the backcountry are the ones that are really getting hit. And so just about the vote yesterday, that was, a, that was a split pie. You've got what you want in community choice aggregation, and then you have the supervisors going, let's put all this stuff in East County. And so it was a no-win situation. So I understand where you were at. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. With which supervisors are up for election? Bill <laughs> Horn. <laughs> well, I ask that because those are the people that you have an issue with. So you need to know, from my perspective at least, where yeah, the power is. in my spare in time. <laughs> well, you know, We're gonna have obviously power. you're taking on a ton of things. Yeah, but way, way over but my head. But those two offices, Bill Horn and Ron Roberts, I believe those are the ones, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe those are the ones that are up for election. I think you're right. And so right now, um, we should all be trying to figure out somebody to either replace them or get them on board doing the right thing. Well, and make sure they are going to do the right thing. I, like I said, I thought that Supervisor Dave Roberts might be kind of step in the shoes of Supervisor Slater Price and be a little more willing to listen to the supervisors whose districts are impacted. But he, he actually said at a clean tech um, showcase that I went to, one of the few regular people there, that his goal of doing what the community wanted, he realized wasn't, wasn't feasible in this case. So easy for him to say when it's not his constituents. And so I take is one of his constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do want to get you out early and get home. It's still, it's, it's not Friday yet. We can stay and party all night. What do you think? <laughs> Um, so, Elaine gets to follow that and explain to us how CCA relates to that. No, not really, but if you have any comments about that, Lane, if we welcome them. Um, I don't know all of Lane's history. I know you were a solar investor at one time, or still are, is that correct? But I do know that he's a co-founder of uh, the uh, CCA effort here with Mr. Bill Powers and perhaps uh, another gentleman. That, that folks know. Uh, Steve Hoffman, was he a co-founder as well, or did he come on later? He was involved for a while. Yeah, he was involved for a while uh, from NRG, who's, who actually uh, sent his, uh, alter, his alternate here uh, one night about a year or so ago. So I'm delighted to have Lane come and tell us how we can, why we should, and how we can fast track a CCA and get the right kind of CCA and that's not a very good question, but I'm tired, so Lane, hit it. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, and uh, thank you. Uh, it's always uh, a pleasure to listen to Donna because I always get a chance to uh, learn new things. And, uh, you know, I, I first, I think I want to thank everybody here who directly or indirectly participated in what I think was a very historic moment yesterday 
for all five of those supervisors to uh, gleefully uh, approve CCA, not necessarily knowing what they were approving. <laughs> because I don't think that all of them really know what's in store for them with uh, community choice aggregation the way that we envision it here in San Diego, which is consistent with uh, Donna's view, consistent with the view of local resources, uh, not imported resources. Um, so I, I want to, with that high note, uh, share with you a few observations. Uh, net energy metering has been a failure in the state of California, number one. Solar in the city buildings of San Diego will be a failure in the current context. Pio Pico, if it's built, could kill CCA in San Diego as a result of creating a stranded asset and charging back to the CCA customers the parting exit fees that would be uh, unbearable to creating a competitive energy rate. <clears throat> um, SDG&E is in a death spiral along with many other utilities, and they know it, and they're fighting hard to get every $10 that they can get out of every single customer, and uh, they will continue to uh, layer on one pancake after another pancake. So um, why do you go through one uh, industrial complex after another industrial uh, uh, neighborhood? in San Diego and see no solar on the rooftops? None. You do that because San Diego has a charge called the demand charge. So that means that if you turn on your industrial machinery for 15 minutes, you'll get hit with twenty or thirty thousand dollars in demand charges for those 15 minutes. Just for using your power for 15 minutes, you could get hit with twenty or thirty thousand dollars worth of demand charges. And so if you happen to have solar when uh, uh, it's a little cloudy, it doesn't matter whether or not you produce 100%, you could still have that twenty dollars or $30,000 worth of charges. That's another way that San Diego Gas and Electric uh, layers in its, uh, its uh, what I like to call the San Diego Gas and Electric tax. So until you all agree that you want your own energy company, you will not have a successful solar regime in San Diego. You will continue to have these fiascos in the backcountry. You will continue to see these uh, industrial rooftops. You will continue to be asking for a feed-in tariff. This is ridiculous. It is so patently obvious to me and to Bill and to a lot of other people what you need. You need your own energy company your company. Am I, is that clear to everybody here or is it not clear to everybody <laughs> That's clear. here? That's clear. <laughs> okay, so when you get your own energy company and how long are you going to wait to get your own energy company? Well, it's unfortunately Nicole is not here. She's one of the people that controls that knob. She controls that knob. She's a staffer. She's going to probably be here in the next administration. How fast does she turn that knob? You know, she's she's kind of like you could hear her. She's kind of like running the calculus. Do I turn it too fast and and have it you know break, or too slow and it takes too long? You know, she's running that calculus, and I appreciate that. <clears throat> who's turning the who's turning the knob in the uh, county? That's a good question. Uh, I don't I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Maybe it'll be Jay. Maybe Jay will get in and uh, turn that knob. We, we'd like that. We, we recommended Jay to do that. <laughs> I don't think people know who you're talking about. Yeah, Jay, what's it? Uh, Powell. Powell. Yeah, Jay Powell is a wonderful retired uh, Sierra Club guy. And uh, we had a meeting with uh, Dave Roberts and Dan Jacob. And we recommended Jay to come in and help Dave Roberts, who wants to move the CCA ball down the road. 
I, I also want to give everybody, uh, since I brought everybody down a little bit, I want to lift them up a little bit now. So we're going to lift you up. And um, there's going to be, in my estimation, a company maybe 10 times the size of Qualcomm in San Diego that will blow uh, the top off of energy storage and will completely eliminate worldwide the need for uh, beaker plants. So watch out for that. The very, very exciting project for which I'm, uh, in, in which I'm involved. Um, lastly, we need to make energy companies, the people's energy companies, plug and play, not brain damaged. You see how brain damaged I've become? Uh, I, I, you know, if you look inside of this brain, of this, you know, you cut this open, you would see, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, ugly things in there. <laughs> it's a wreck in there. Yeah, so we need to uh, avoid what I would call Lane Sharmanitis, you know, in, in the state of California, which is to make CCAs plug and play. And the way to make them plug and play, in my view, is to create a statewide JPA where the city of Carlsbad has no risk. It just basically signs on the dotted line. The JPA has a default program. It has a default local program. It has a default tariff. It has 30% or 40% renewable content at the same price, and it just makes it uh, drop dead easy for every single city in the state of California to join and become, have its own energy company. We have to do this quickly. That is one of the things that we keep hearing over and over and over again, and it requires participation, and engagement and fundraising and giving and, and making this 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 happen. So uh, I think I'm going to uh, end my little uh, diatribe and uh, and uh, leave it for some more Q and A. Um, I have a Q. I hope you have the A. Um, when you say our power company, thank you. When you say our power company. I know it's. I know this has been an evolution for you, but um, when we first talked about it, I know you were talking about cooperatives. Do you remember that? You, you came to one of my first events. In fact, you were the first event you came to after you did your own event was was mine, Lane. You know, it's terrible. My brain still there's some cobwebs in there, but there's still some neural synapsing going on. So <clears throat> the cooperative may or may not be dead. I don't know. But when you say our, who owns? In your mind, who who should own this business? Because it's a business. Uh, who owns a public school? That that and that would be a question that somebody you know brighter than me would be able to answer. Uh, but in answering this question, uh, once the CCA, as a uh, public company, a company owned. Uh, for the benefit of its, the people that it serves is like a water district. And so as a water district, you might say the ratepayers are the beneficiaries and uh, it is a public institution. It is not a for-profit institution. There, there are no shareholders. It is a true public entity. So uh, how does it run as a public entity? Well, it ought to be run according to the bylaws of that public entity. And that's where writing of the bylaws is going to be a very, very important activity. And we ought to start thinking about that. Uh, now that we've got CCA in play at both the county and at the city level, that's a very, very big uh, accomplishment in my estimation from you know, the last two years, so, would you say? Yes. Okay. That's Thank clear. Thank you. It's a public entity. Good. Um, Bill, you earlier mentioned PO Pico, and you just mentioned it again. Um, I was at the hearing where the CPUC voted down Quail Brush and put off PO Pico, and then I'm sorry I've been out of the loop. I've been running around doing other things. But what happened that that's back on the table? I thought they had to kick this down. Soft. Senate no freight. Shut down. And so they're going to fast track it. Fast track POP to replace songs, even though they in that hearing said, no, we're not. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. They, they just basically lied? Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's being a little harsh. <laughs> um, okay, I just I, I thought I missed something here, but okay. Um, all right, thanks. No, the PUC gave them the option. Uh, come in. Um, and we knew this was a problem at the time. They gave them the option of amending their application to line up the start date to something the PUC thought was more suitable. Um, so even if Songs had not announced a permanent closure, we wouldn't have been surprised if SDG&E eventually came back and said, we've amended the application, we've fiddled with a few things, we're gonna try again. And I thought that eventually was 2016, they were throwing out the dates. 2018, 2018 is when the presumed, yeah. supposed right. need we're gonna right. have is all gonna come crashing down and, and such. But So the, the announcement that Songs is permanently closed, that's when we knew, oh, now it's gonna be you know, an all-you-can-eat buffet for sdg &E because they're, now they're talking about doing natural gas power plants up at Camp Pendleton, and they're gonna melt this San Onofre deal big time. Even or though still pointed out, or that Alan pointed out, we made it through two summers Right. Minus songs with no problem. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I really want to focus in on this. If we do not move forward with getting our own energy company, we will have shafted ourselves. That, that, that shaft, we will have shafted ourselves. Yes, Alan. So I uh, just have some questions about your vision. Um, as you know, uh, with direct access, what the utilities did is they started taking uh, the additional monies they wanted in revenue and putting them on the transmission distribution side and not on the generation side. Right. And consequently, uh, even if you had direct access, it reduced the benefits substantially. And so what is your vision for CCA? How would you propose to deal with either creating your own distribution, because like, you wouldn't need transmission if this was done right, and or uh, uh, negotiating somehow or other with the utility to use their system? I believe it's called downsizing. I think that San Diego Gas and Electric needs to learn how to downsize, just like a lot of other businesses learn how to downsize. San Diego Gas and Electric, like all utilities, needs to learn how to downsize. This is the era of utility downsizing, and uh, it's called creative destruction and capitalism. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, the utilities are struggling uh, so strongly against, uh, you know, creating these pancakes, these in perpetuity pancakes, like 10 bucks per meter, you know. They know that they're in a death spiral, and it's well documented that the more people who opt out, the fewer customers there are to support their infrastructure. So the more they have to charge, and the more people that opt out, that's the death spiral. And San Diego Gas and Electric has to come to the table and understand that if they want to stay in the game, they've got to learn how to play ball with the people of San Diego. And the people of San Diego have got to get tough. It's a dogfight right now, just as Bill said. And that dogfight is people have got to get in the game and explain, you know, capitalism works a certain way and capitalism allows for the uh, best kinds of solutions, the best kinds of innovations. And, you know, why do we have this kind of an innovation? Because we have competition. We have had no competition, and that's why the electricity system looks so much like it did 100 years ago, right? Yeah. So I, I have a question, just briefly, I don't get to talk to you very often, but uh, I don't mean to be a mic hog. <laughs> <laughs> the PUC, CPUC, is appointed by the governor of the state of California. He's made what's alleged to be some pretty good appointments. But from what we hear, they're going to roll with Pio Pico and all this stuff. Why aren't we able to get to the governor? Do you have any thoughts about the governor? Can you help me think about the governor in a way that's more positive than the way I'm thinking right now? We need a new governor. <laughs> well, I don't think that's going to happen. Well, it depends on, never mind. <laughs> I, I think it would be incumbent upon San Diegans and the businesses that care about staying in business in San Diego to put together a legal fund. 
you know, there should be a, a coordinated legal fund, and then that legal fund ought to, uh, you know, allocate some money to the Sierra Club, to the San Diego Energy District Foundation, to EHC, and you know, really help those uh, individual uh, 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 groups fight a successful fight, and then be able to retain some of that for an appeal. Because I think that there is going to need to be an appeal if this thing does get uh, approved. And if I may, Kathleen, to, to answer your question, those people, if I understand correctly, on the CPUC are appointed for seven or nine year terms. Or something. It's longer than the governor's term, so he does not have the authority to fire them, which from a political standpoint probably makes sense that we couldn't have somebody come in and just clean house and do whatever, but the one person he has appointed came from CCSE um, and has, you know, some... No, that's the CPUC. That's the CPUC. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he doesn't have the authority, from what I understand, to just clear house. So it doesn't, you know, we have to wait a long time for that turnover. If, if I'm, am I correct in that, Lee? Is that true? Uh, Bill, you've had a lot of uh, dealings with the PUC over, do you have any strategy, uh, uh, commentary about how to kill P.O. Pico right now, or what is the, what is the killing strategy for P.O. Pico? Well, one, one comment, Heather. One comment on the PUC. Governor Brown has appointed four of the five PUC commissioners. Has he? And, but the, the, the real signal is he has not replaced President Peavy. And Peavy is uh, the key. Peavy is the status quo. And he, the governor, is comfortable with that. And so that's just the way it is uh, at this point. But you're right, for P.O. Pico, it, it does have to be set up to be a, a lawsuit, an appeal. And I think there are some groups involved that would probably be willing to do that. So that's already underway. So I was in on a little bit of this, and one of the things with the former mayor, who unfortunately remains nameless at all these events, because no one wants to say, Bob Felner. <laughs> um, Bob was, Bob went to the hearings Bob was taken aside and boxed about the ears by certain segments that deal with nails and root flavor. And he was on the path, the path. This, is, this all comes around to the mayoral discussion we had earlier this evening. Because if we don't have a mayor, we're blue. San Diego, the city of, is blue demographically speaking, and getting bluer all the time. And so if we don't have a mayor that represents those values, I'm not talking about the Democratic Party, I'm talking about these values. We don't have someone to go to, to do what Bob Filner was willing to do, which was take on the utilities. And uh, all his other, I, I, we always have to say this, and all his other failings aside, okay, mm -hmm. said, okay? So the thing is, they're serious, but said. But um, this is kind of what it comes around to. Don't you explain, don't you think the mayor kind of matters, the big mayor in the region, or not? Uh, uh, less and less so, just using your own uh, thoughts uh, half an hour, 45 minutes ago. I think it, it's a, a matter of you, you know, you the people and you the people turning the knob uh, on the, the officials, you know, and, and getting in their face and making your uh, voice very clearly heard often, 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 and then uh, really saying, hey, I'm ready for my own energy company. I want my own energy company here in San Diego. And just making that message so clear and so simple, my energy company, we can all say that. And then all of a sudden they start investigating and they, they, they start turning the wheels with their staff and then pretty soon it starts to happen and that's what's, that is the work that Bill and I have done since October of 2011. It's now coming on October 2013. We have taken the ball down the road. We have submitted our invoice. We are now waiting to get paid so that we can take the next two years to move this thing across the finish line here in San Diego. All this is figurative, by the way, that there's no end to it. That was not a symbolic. <laughs> Get excited. All right, let's 
take one question, maybe two, and then we are done for the evening. Thank you, Lane. That was very, very. Which, which, which direction? There? And frightening at the same time. That's Lane. It's Casey and frightening. Okay. Thank you for the microphone pass. That was great coordination. Um, the right question comes out of ignorance. So it sounds like there's two options. There's having a monopoly, almost a monopoly, or competition. Um, but what about just having an individual or a company choose to just be off the grid? Why can't they just do that? They can. They can. You can. Uh, Bill Powers is uh, a very disgruntled uh, SCG&E customer, and he's going off the grid right now. If you want to, uh, I have a customer in Escondido, and we talked to him about disconnecting from SCG&E. Uh, the internet works so well because of the interconnectedness and that great ecology. If we have our own energy company, we want our energy customers to be like the city of San Diego, where they produce power and we buy that power. This is why net energy metering has been a failure. You can't put excess solar on your roof like Van, and I can't buy it because there's not a buyer. You need to have a buyer and we need to be interconnected as a group of um, property owners so that we can do local build out and buy that power from one another and have a company that facilitates that that's not facilitating it for profit, but for, but for facilitating it for um, uh, affordability, uh, innovation, uh, greenhouse gas reduction, all the reasons that we're here. And uh, that's why you want your own energy company. It, this is so important to have your own energy company and, and to operate it like the internet, which is a peer-to-peer -peer <coughs> network. I guess I get the last question. Thank you again. Uh, <laughs> uh, what happened uh, at the Board of Supervisors was an excellent result. Uh, I don't think you expected 5-0. No, it's not. Um, I thought we were going to get shot down. <laughs> but I think that result came from the type of turnout that you were able to generate along with the coalition that you're working with. Um, so I don't, I don't know how many we have there, maybe 30 at least, uh, maybe more, I don't know. But Nicole's over there uh, talking about, you're talking about the calculus that she's doing, and Nicole's been talking about providing elected officials cover and wanting to see the public provide that cover. So. You know, what you did with the Board of Supervisors was provide some cover and some right. pressure by turning people out. Right. So the question is, have you thought about whether or not it's time to go to San Diego City Council, uh, whether it be, um, you know, in a public comment session or whatever, to apply some of that education and pressure uh, so that we get whatever it is we need out of the mayor's office because frankly I thought we were getting what we needed out of Bob Filner's office and for whatever reason it's uh, I don't know what the status of the application is now and so forth but uh, it sounds to me like there's something else that needs to be done by the city before SDG and e gives us the low data that we're looking for for the feasibility study is that correct and you want to clarify uh, Bill you're a little closer to the answer than I am the, that's, uh, I haven't seen the final communication to SDG, but that should be rolling uh, anytime. I mean, the interim mayor is not slowing that up. Okay. The wheels turn in government, as you know, really fast, <laughs> right, Pam? Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. End of well, discussion. <laughs> at least we have Nicole in there fighting a good fight on yeah. that. And so, um, thank you very much. I,